You know, so, so I'm going to uh, talk about political movements, but uh, we'll try to uh, look at it uh, through um, some theoretical lenses, uh, which I will call identity constitutionalism. Uh, and I will hopefully explain how it relates. Um, so the year of 2030 is not that far away. The world, I think, will not be radically different. Uh, Rafael Nadal will win Roland Garros, Vladimir Putin will secure another presidential term, and Maggie Simpson will still not talk. Yet the face of constitutionalism is likely to alter significantly life, because it has been changing for the last two decades, offering us a glimpse into its future. Its deep entrenchment in uh, Western political organization has provided us, uh, as uh, Christoph mentioned at the beginning, uh, with a mistaken feeling that it is here to stay indefinitely. Uh, the success of constitutionalism in the last 50 years has been to a great extent uh, due to its marriage with the idea of fundamental rights, which has supplied constitutionalism uh, with moral authority and due to the seemingly apolitical conflict resolution mechanism, uh, a judicial review and balancing that has enhanced this authority. Uh, this version of constitutionalism, rights-based constitutionalism, seems to be in crisis. Uh, the the rights-based constitutionalism removed questions most significant for the identity of political communities from politics, while courts has been increasingly failing to provide answers, be it the war on terror, the Great Recession and material inequality, or governing under the pandemic emergency. Uh, the, the, the growing discontent caused partly by this tacit suppression of political identity discourse was exploited by uh, political movements that were willing to challenge the post-war consensus in the West. The combination of old recipes, nationalism, Christianity, sovereignty, concealed or not so concealed bigotry, with modern political marketing is unfortunately working quite well. Outside the West, rights-based constitutionalism has failed spectacularly in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. It has been questioned in Latin America for its collusion with neoliberalism. Its embedded individualism has been seen as foreign uh, to Asian values. The geopolitical decline of rights-based constitutionalism's exporters adds to that. These challenges in the West and East, North and South suggest the need for reconsidering the rights-based approach based on the pretenses of eternal and universal values and neutral adjudication of fundamental political conflicts in favor of openly political approach where constitutionalism provides a discursive platform for the formation of collective identity. Call it identity constitutionalism. Before unwrapping this idea, allow me to address methodological difficulties that structured my contribution and help to clarify its purpose. When preparing uh, this presentation, images from two series of Star Trek, uh, the original series and the next generation were constantly coming into my mind. And what I found striking was how much the visual representation of the same future, as well as issues uh, the mankind would face, changed in two decades that separate uh, the two series. That makes me to formulate two limitations. First limitation is that we cannot but imagine the future through concepts we have. Notice at this 1980s imagination of a smartwatch, the floppy disk in particular. The second limitation is that in addressing the future, we use narratives that are comprehensible to discourse participants today, that relate to their experience. Otherwise, there is no communication and hence no point 
in such a baby. The other group of challenges relate more directly to scientific methodology. On the one hand, the only method we can legitimately use is to research the past and identify causes of current problems so that they can be addressed. But sometimes it might be too late. On the other hand, pointing out problems that have not fully developed yet weakens the impact of such analysis. And here comes the advantage of this project. Some see, setting the mark for 2030 allows me to assess the problem in their maturity if no action is taken. This, however, brings an additional problem, mixing up normative with descriptive. Since the facts are yet to happen, uh, we tend to exaggerate the gravity of immediate events and oscillate between dystopia and utopia, between projecting our fears and our hopes or getting too much ahead. So I, do, I will do my best not to be carried away with this unusual scientific freedom and stick to the projection of long-term trends beyond the present. Yet the normative descriptive problem works also to my advantage. While I focus on projecting trends beyond the present, my prediction is based on that alternative vision of 2030 where we will have taken a corrective action. Here is another advantage of the project. I think I have never used uh, future perfect tense in, uh, in my life. So what is my prediction? By 2030, identity constitutionalism will supersede rights-based constitutionalism. Political movements will succeed courts as its main driving force. I see four interrelated reasons for the decline of rights-based constitutionalism. First, material inequality and the publicity of this phenomena reaches a critical point. The partnership of convenience between neoliberalism with its conceptually embedded indifference to material inequality and rights or human rights forged in the 1970s starts to undermine the legitimacy of rights-based constitutionalism. The rising material inequality has also highlighted other dimensions of structural injustices in our systems against certain groups, such as non-Caucasian minorities or women, that rights-based constitutionalism, despite all its effort, failed to rectify. The second reason is related to the disintegration of post-war Christian social democratic consensus. It was this consensus that catalyzed the rights-based constitutionalism in the West and its global export. At the core of this consensus was a common solution to social tensions caused primarily by industrialization and accompanying phenomena that directly led to the success of populist movements combining socialism and nationalism in the interwar period. Part of this consensus was the removal of fundamental political questions from politics and their fortification through dubious, uh, dubious deployment of constitutionalism and legalism, eternity clauses being the example here. Uh, this consensus was the result of the ascendancy of Christian democratic and socialist or social democratic parties in the post-war period and their decline clear after the Great Recession leads to the disintegration of this consensus. The third reason for the crisis of rights-based constitutionalism is the success of non-liberal, non-democratic regimes in providing security, stability, and growth, and correlative failure of number of liberal democratic attempts in Russia, Latin America, Southeast Asia, or the Arab world to do the same, Europe not excluded. This has two facets. First, the emergence of these alternatives undermines the idea of liberal democracy as the ultimate regime, a matter of human progress, and as such, morally superior. And second, the, alternative, the alternatives force rights-based constitutionalism to compromise on its own premises, which undermines its coherence, such as speech control or property rights control in reaction to interference by autocratic regimes. 
Finally, uh, the centrality of courts in this version of constitutionalism has changed from being the solution to being part of the problem. The pretense that civil rights, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, the pretense that the civil rights uh, adjudication does not have distributional effects is untenable. When it comes to more overt distributional question, the courts have proved with minor exceptions, unable or unwilling to address socioeconomic injustices. And reframing these problems as civil rights issues has not worked fast or well enough to prevent escalating social tensions as the rise of uh, the Me Too uh, and the Black Lives Matter movements indicate. <clears throat> Furthermore, uh, the Great Recession and the pandemic reveal how much courts have trapped themselves into their own doctrines developed in and for different times. They are expected to challenge trillion euros political decisions or pandemic lockdowns using their balancing magic. In face of the impact of things like the fiscal constitution, drug is whatever it takes policy or unprecedented economic recovery packages, courts reactions such as OMT or PSPP judgments look funny and parochial and unfortunately increasingly detached from reality. I'm sorry to disagree uh, with Stephanie here. <clears throat> so the solution in my view is to repoliticize constitutionalism while keeping the major achievements of the rights era. If you watched uh, the trial of uh, Derek Chauvin in these past days, you could see how the Black Lives Matter movement was demanding the court to convict Chauvin of second degree murder, that is the gravest of the three charges against Chauvin, and threatened directly or indirectly a civil unrest in case of acquittal. There was no usual pretense of impartial rule of law delivering justice. The movement was determined, given the judicial track record in these matters, to force the result. This has been the strategy of conservative populist movements in the United States and Europe in their quest to bypass parliaments and courts and appeal directly to the people, undermining the idea of rule of law, separation of powers, and neutrality of judicial decision making. Rights and courts have become their target. Once they gain, they gain control over them, they use constitutionalism for power consolidation. In a stark contrast to that, progressive liberal movements have always relied on the power of rights in societal imagination and rights adjudication. Frustration with regime resilience, as well as competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the populist it creates, changing this asymmetry. The strong appeal of the populist movements come from, uh, comes from their resurrection of identity politics, offering a sense of fraternity and privilege in various forms, nationwide, Christian, and so on, which seems to attract younger generation in particular. And the reason seems to be their frustration with demands for individual responsibility and individualism as such, resulting both from liberalism and capitalism. But the same identity term can be employed by progressive movements. Compare uh, uh, the Me Too and the Black Lives Matter movements with, for instance, the Occupy Wall Street movement. The Occupy Wall Street movement failed to achieve a meaningful change. The regulatory responses in the US and the European uh, Union or Europe in general were not answers to the distribution of demands of the movement but to macroeconomic stability. The Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movements have shown more potential in this regard, and part of it is their identity component, black women. Well, these are not particularly uh, favorable developments for constitutionalism, whose projections forward would mean further undermining of the rule of law and the capacity of courts to participate in public discourse. <clears throat> and, and checking together uh, with parliaments the executive power. 
The adaptation of constitutionalism will require to intertwine the advantages manifested by constitutionalism so far and, and uh, uh, combine it with a more political and communal focus. What are these advantages? First, it is constitutionalism's ability to concentrate political discourse on the fundamentals through a thi single document listing the main substantive and organizational principle of the given community. Second, it has manifested the ability to rationalize political discourse through legal reasoning by a court. And third, it has shown that it can actually itself create a genuinely new political identity. How different this process uh, can be is well visible when we compare various we the people theories in the United States on the one hand and say patriotic constitutionalism in Germany on the other hand. While the specific contexts are perhaps irreplicable, I believe that the key lies in certain general conditions under which constitutionalism serve a community building function in different cultural environments and thus regain its universal potential. So let me briefly explain what I mean. For constitutionalism to have or enhance its community building function, the constitution must be central to public discourse when fundamental questions of our political identity are concerned. In other words, these question, questions must be discussed through uh, what the, the Constitution means. So my question is, what are, the con what are these conditions that make the Constitution central to public discourse? And consequently, if this practice is sufficiently internalized, may structure private discourse on identity questions as well, such as between child and parent. First condition, I will title constitutional authenticity. That is, the citizens must consider the constitution to be of their own making. Now, uh, this, is con this, this, uh, this is constructed in any case, uh, but it can be more closer to reality or more removed from reality. So there are different strategies for constructing such outcome. Um, revolutionary constitutions, uh, would be perceived by citizens more as their own making and have therefore uh, better potential for constitutional authenticity. But this can be replaced as again, the case of Germany shows with a new beginning narrative, uh, having basically the same cons uh, similar consequences. They are not the same because uh, they lead uh, to uh, quite different structure of the constitution the foundationalism, if you like. And so we can see some basic metrics uh, created uh, from uh, the combination of revolutionary, uh, new beginning, non-revolutionary continuity uh, narratives uh, with some examples which I try to put uh, together. So e each category in this matrix will require a different strategy. And uh, the ones which don't have the revolutionary new beginning advantage must construct it in some other way. Second condition I call normative compatibility. Um, that's pr probably the most, uh, would be most uh, controversial. Uh, it requires since, uh, so we can identify three main normative orders which uh, 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 might form identity. Uh, political identity, public identity. Uh, to simplify, let's say uh, there, will, there are three normative orders operating in every, uh, every state uh, or every political community. International human rights as some kind of a, a global moral code. Morality, which directly or indirectly is based on religion. Uh, and domestic legal order. Uh, the constitution, in order to be the primary uh, venue of allegiance uh, and then have uh, uh, the possibility to serve as a uh, political identity um, 
uh, have this political identity formation function needs to incorporate all these three normative orders and create some kind of uh, um, uh, compatibility between them. Uh, the result of that is uh, that people do not need to choose between allegiance to, uh, let's say, religion or uh, the nation, uh, but through constitution, uh, they can have the allegiance uh, to all these spheres. Um, of course, this is more visible in, uh, in uh, let's say, Islamic constitutionalism, where Sharia is incorporated through constitutional provisions into the constitution in some way um, that, for example, no law can be uh, com contra can contravene um, Islam or Sharia. But at the same time, you have um, uh, the same uh, incorporation of human rights, either constitutional or through international law. And um, uh, there were some, uh, there are some examples how this can be uh, made compatible, like the Pakistani harmonization doctrine or some attempts of uh, Mubarak era Egyptian. The third condition uh, focus on the institutions. Um, that is, uh, the constitutional system needs to create such institutional setting and inter institutional mechanism for conflict resolution that forces public officials to prefer constitutional arguments over the others. Uh, advantages of identity constitutionalism vis-a-vis -vis the alternatives to community building, so nationalism or uh, religious identity and so on, is that through the compatibility uh, condition, it's open to global norms and uh, hence transnational cooperation. At the same time, in comparison to the universal promise of rights uh, and consequently rights-based constitutionalism, they allow more culture adaptation that rights singularity prevent, and thus enhancing the authenticity. And this brings me uh, to the actors. So while courts remain critical for rationalizing the discourse, they will be, as a number of theories already claim from constitutional pluralism in both the Canadian and the European versions, to the backlash theory, to the constitutional moment theory, understood more as part of the discourse than its end. In other words, they will lose their monopoly on constitutional interpretation, real or imagined, with court's role diminished, even if still crucial, the constitutionalisms refocus from individual rights to collective identity will likely make political movements rather than traditional parties the main drivers of the discourse. Moreover, we are likely to see more concentration of political movements on both the populist and progressive sides along the culture, religion, uh, religion, regional lines. Uh, in particular, uh, continuing federalization of the Euro area, driven by both the Great Recession and the pandemic experiences, will correlatively increase the appeal for these movements to control the European Parliament and indirectly uh, the Commission. This tendency is likely to take place also in those parts of the world where regional identity is historically strong, such as the Arab world. There, social movements with political aspirations might take the lessons from the Arab Spring and seek better organization and cooperation next time around. To conclude, uh, constitutionalism might play the prime role in Western political organization in 2030 and become more acceptable elsewhere if rights-based approach will have been replaced with more political and communal approach. It may foster universal discursive conditions while encouraging substantive differentiation between political communities at the same time. I believe that lowering our demands on substantive constitutional content and focusing on making the constitution central or restituting its centrality 
to political discourse through the three conditions of authenticity, normative compatibility, and institutional adversariality will moderate religious and national extremism, increase regional cooperation, and gradually democratize political regimes. Thank you.